Welcome. It's the Feast of Pentecost. And the reading we have for the Gospel today is from St John, the end of chapter 15 and the beginning of chapter 16. When the Advocate comes, whom I will send you, from the Father, the Spirit of Truth, who comes from the Father, he will testify on my behalf. You also are to testify because you have been with me from the beginning. But I have said these things to you so that when the hour comes, you may remember that I told you about them. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you. But now I am going to him who sent me. Yet none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow fills your hearts. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will prove the world wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin, because they did not believe in me. About righteousness, because I am going to the Father, and you will see me no longer. About judgment, because the ruler of this world has been condemned. I have still many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, because he has taken. He will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. For this reason, I said he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Pentecost is the most wonderful season. After the devastation of the cross, when everything seemed broken and wasted and ended, our Lord rises from the dead. So many people see him, but not everyone recognises him immediately. There's a kind of mystery to his presence. And then he says, wait. Wait for the Holy Spirit to come down. And at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit does come down. And many people call it the birthday of the church. And it came, he came in great drama. And there are many ways of understanding the Holy Spirit. Perhaps the most important way is to think of the Holy Spirit as, as God in the present tense. The Lord, now, helping me, in me, with me, showing me, leading me, enabling me, now. God of the now. Very often we look to God the Father and he seems a long way away in the past. He created us, he created the world, he's waiting at the end of time, but he, he seems a long way away. And it is the Spirit who allows us to call out to him, Abba. It's the Holy Spirit that says, Father, and allows us to recognise this mind that created the universe as our, as our daddy. Jesus is God come alongside us. And slowly one of the great experiences in Christianity is this God drawing close, the creator of the universe who then makes himself known and puts on a body and a face and a tone of voice and actions. And we discover he's incredibly kind and wonderfully hopeful and locked in a struggle with perversity and evil on our behalf. And, and, and this God intends to come closer still. He's not content to wait for us at the end of time or the beginning of, of the universe. He's not content simply to put on humanity and enter history and allow us to hear his voice. He wants to come into our hearts as close as we will allow him. And that's the Holy Spirit, God utterly present in the moment in our hearts. This is the most astonishing thing. St. Seraphim of Sarov, who was a Russian saint in the 1860s, did the most amazing miracles. 
he said the most important thing for the Christian is to acquire the Holy Spirit. Well, Pentecostals talk about baptism in the Spirit, and that's a kind of uh, overt um, drenching in the presence and Spirit of God. Wonderful. The Spirit comes in so many ways. He can drench us in a moment. He can, he can rise up through the roots of our praying, slowly spreading through the arteries of our being like water through a plant. He can suddenly speak to us and show us things we, we, we didn't know. He, he first of all shows us who Jesus is. He shows us the Father. And then, of course, he shows us what's going on around us. St. Paul talks about the gifts of the Spirit, in a, and we realise that this is life in the supernatural, and that we're not called to live life in the natural. With the Holy Spirit, we're called to live life in the beyond natural, in the realm of the Spirit. St. Paul says to us, I don't want you to be ignorant about the gifts of the Spirit, as you were when you were unbelievers. You know, there are different kind of gifts, he says. They all come from the same Lord. And uh, he describes what they do to, to some people. The Spirit gives a message of wisdom. That means God in the now, who comes to help us, gives us a depth of understanding we couldn't possibly have managed through our own intelligence. But this is what the Spirit does. He shows us things, um, things that we, we wouldn't otherwise have known for the kingdom of heaven. Other people are given a message of knowledge. They look at a situation or a person and they know what's going on beyond the natural, beyond the intelligent. This is a, a wonderful gift to have. Others <clears throat> get given the gift of faith. To have this deeper gift of faith and trust that acts as an example with which we can say to the rest of the church, look, follow me. It's quite okay. We can... We can walk on, on the surface of the ice. It will hold our weight. Look how this is done. This wonderful gift of faith is one that is intended to help those who are doubtful or timid or anxious or wounded. It is the most marvellous gift, the gift of faith, which the Spirit gives. A kind of real gutsy confidence in God. To others, the Spirit gives the gift of healing. Healing is a great mystery. It's very hard to know why God heals sometimes and why not at others. It's very hard to know why some people have a, the gift and mediate it to the church and, and others don't. And why some of us do sometimes and not other times. But in that, we have to simply learn to trust that God will work in the way he intends to. To some he gives the power to do miracles. Well, that's quite extraordinary. We should look for the miraculous. We should look for the supernatural reordering of life for the kingdom of heaven. Not on our own behalf, not to make things easier, but for the kingdom, for the presence of God, and certainly pray for it. To some, he gives the ability to prophesy. What's God saying to us in this situation? This is a hugely important gift. We need prophets. We need people to be brave enough to say, I think the Lord is saying this to the church today. Because there are plenty of people who will offer an opinion on what God's mind is in the situation and frankly not have the faintest idea. It's come out of their own specious fancy. And, and we very badly need people to whom the Lord has given the gift of prophecy to say, this is the Lord's mind on, the, on this matter then there's a gift that I have longed for the whole of my Christian life, the gift to tell the spirits apart, the gift of discernment. Lord, is this from you or is it from the other side? Or is it a vacancy, a neutrality? What's going on, Father? That gift in particular of discernment is, is absolutely vital when it comes to distinguishing how the kingdom of heaven is working and, again, what's going on. Then there's tongues, of course, uh, and the interpretation of tongues. All this, says St. Paul, is given by the same Spirit. And then, and then there's what happens when the Spirit has his way in someone's life. There's the fruit of the Spirit. These wonderful qualities that are in the image of God. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. 
My goodness, how much of the Holy Spirit we need. No wonder St. Seraphim said we must acquire the Holy Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, we need them all so badly. And when we have them, God is made so much more present in a home, in the public space, in the church, than he is otherwise. It is the Spirit, the breath of God, who breathes his fragrance into us and who breathes his fragrance into the spaces we inhabit. Come, Holy Spirit. But we can grieve the Spirit. We can grieve the Spirit by trying to be independent, in a relying on ourselves much too much. Very dangerous for men in particular. Men in particular have a capacity to think, I can do it on my own, my own muscularity, my strength, my power, my doggedness. In my experience, women are much more less likely to grieve the Holy Spirit by saying, being able to say help much more quickly. It's hard for the men with our pride to say, Lord, help. We grieve the Holy Spirit when we act as if we don't need him, don't want him, don't love him, uh, and are getting on fine. But of course, we're not getting on fine. We often run around like a, like a car with the fuel gauge on nearly empty, when there's not enough love, not enough joy, not enough peace, gentleness, goodness, kindness or self-control. Come, Holy Spirit, help me not grieve you. Knowing the difference between spirits is immensely important. We've just had the royal wedding. And one of the things that happened is, is we've had the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church in America preaching at the wedding. This has been very much a sheep and goats moment. I've been very surprised, really taken aback, in fact. For some time, I was a passionate exponent of, of LGBT rights on the grounds I wanted my, my gay friends protected and loved. It took the Holy Spirit to tell me that I was wrong and invite me to repent about gay rights and the practice of sexuality, both straight and homosexual and varied. And we're at a period where there is something like a new reformation. Do you remember the, other, the old reformation? The old reformation came because the church kept the reality of God too distant from ordinary people. They didn't have the scriptures to encounter God in. They didn't have enough of the sacrament to feed on God at the Eucharist. They were sole indulgences um, and they were taught things that were became became distorted. Now so many people look back to the Reformation and like the generals always fighting the last war, imagine that that's the trouble in the church. But this time we have a new Reformation. Then the Spirit was trying to make a deeper connection between people and Jesus. To bridge the gap that the church had somehow sadly created between the institution and between the institution and, and people. And so again today we have a new reformation, but it's along very different lines indeed. This time it's to do with a clash of cultures. There is a, a demonic culture that's coming against the church using uh, a series of values that are antithetic against the opposite of what we find in Scripture. And astonishingly, perhaps not so astonishingly, given our sexualized culture, sex is at the heart of it. And so, of course, when the presiding bishop preaches about, uh, about love, um, a good many people thought this was quite wonderful because romantic love is a very exciting and lovely thing and it's a great thing to see people fall in love. But actually... When you know the scriptures, you know that, that romantic love is, is one of the lower kinds of loves. And it has to grow into a higher kind of love. And one of the things that the presiding bishop, Michael Curry, didn't do in his sermon was he didn't make any distinction between different kinds of loves. And so what he seemed to be doing was saying to people, you can find God in romance and in sex. And by finding God in romance and sex, you can find God everywhere. Of course, you could in a sexualized culture. But 
the problem is that what he needed to do was to tell people that there was a hierarchy of loves and that the first love is the love of God and the second love is the love of neighbour and erotic and sexual love need to be surrendered to God so they can be transformed and when it is quoted that God is love and those who live in love live in God this is not those who live in romantic love or sexual attraction this is agape this is compassion those who live in the ongoing unconditional compassion this is much more the clothing of the naked those who live in that kind of love. This is much more the forgiving of the unforgivable, that kind of love, than the madness that comes across upon two people when they feel deeply attracted to each other. Why does this matter? It matters because there's a tendency to make God in our own image, to make, make him a kind of therapist who pats us on the head and says, um, you do what you want, as long as you feel good about it, that's okay. But this is a false God and a full spirit. And one of the reasons why so many people felt very uncomfortable after the bravura performance, wonderful energy, wonderful colour, great arm movements, great charisma, but not the Holy Spirit. Another spirit teaching things that Jesus never taught. Love yourself, said Michael Curry. Jesus didn't say that. He said, love the Lord your God first. There is scope for loving oneself. But one has to distinguish what kind of love and what part of yourself. The love of self simply straight off is, is indulgence and our culture is born on of indulgence. That's not the gospel. If you love, said Michael Curry, there'll be an end of poverty. But Jesus said there will never be an end of poverty. So again, it wasn't the real Jesus he was talking about. If you love, said Michael Curry, human rights will all come okay. But Jesus didn't talk about human rights. He talked about our obligations as slaves and as friends of God, as servants, as people who throw ourselves on his mercy, not claiming rights, but claiming forgiveness. And so being able to tell the difference between the Holy Spirit and other spirits is, is essential. And Jesus warned that, that people would come saying things in God's name, in Christ's name, that just weren't true. How can we tell? Well, we check them against the Bible. And when you find someone talking about a generalized kind of love and putting words into the mouth of Jesus he never said, then you have to ask, is this the Holy Spirit or another spirit? The church is at a crossroads. Many people are following the spirit of the age, the wrong spirit where the teaching about sexuality that we find in St. Paul and in Leviticus is contradicted and thrown out. But we are called in the church to be obedient to God's revelation and above all to pursue holiness so that God can wash us and clean us and straighten us out and mend us and begin to prepare us for the kingdom of heaven. So the church is dividing today, sadly, and in this new reformation we need to pray for the Holy Spirit to give us the gift of discernment of spirits, to give us gifts of knowledge and prophecy so we know what is on God's mind, to give us a greater confidence of what he is calling us to, to be able to distinguish between the real gospel and one of the false gospels that has troubled the church. There are always false gospels troubling the church, always perversions, always illusions, always siren calls inviting us to something easier, nicer, more congenial. God help the church today receive his breath, receive his purity, receive his gifts and above all maintain our faithfulness to our risen Lord and what he taught. Without the Holy Spirit, there is no church. There is only religion. There are only ideas. There are only moral rules. With the Holy Spirit, there is this dance of love, of agape, of intimacy, of obedience, of joy, the incense of God's presence. Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit. I need more of you.
More of you in my heart, in my life, in my mind, in my past, in my future. Carry me, change me, mend me, melt me, take me, use me. Come, Holy Spirit, purify your church to honour Jesus and allow us to call out to the Creator, Abba, Father, Dad. Bring me home, safe and sound, in obedience and love and trust. To God be the glory forever and ever. Amen.